It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you uh, so much. My first question this morning is, uh, is for the Premier. Patients in Ontario are suffering. They're suffering in pain. Their health outcomes are deteriorating. Their quality of life is deteriorating. They can't get the health care they need and wonder why it is that their government doesn't seem to care. The surgical and diagnostic backlog, as we all know, has ballooned, Speaker. The Ontario Medical Association says 21 million surgeries and procedures are backlogged. People are waiting. The FAO estimated last year in May, Speaker, that it would take three and a half years to take that backlog away, to clear it, and that was before Omicron hit. Why did this Premier fail to plan for and continues to fail to invest in addressing the backlog, even though he knows that the system has reached an unbelievable crisis and that it's Question. going to take years to fix it? Thank you, Speaker. Well, I, I'd like to assure the people of Ontario that our government has planned for and has made those investments in dealing with a number of people who unfortunately have had to wait for orthopedic procedures, in some cases cardiac surgeries and others. What we have done is we have invested $5.1 billion into the hospital services system since the beginning of the pandemic, opening up another 3,100 beds, first to deal with COVID patients, but now to deal with the patients who've been waiting for those surgeries. We've also also invested $500 million into allowing hospitals to operate on weekends and in the evenings so that people can have their surgeries done faster. We, I can advise that the actual number of people who are waiting for surgeries in the province of Ontario is 58,000. We have done extensive work in the the uh, ministry response. to determine this number. It's 58,000, and thanks to the significant investments that we've made, we are working on having those surgeries done faster for the, per, uh, for the uh, people of Ontario who've been waiting so long to have. Thank you. The supplementary. Here's, it appears that what the minister is saying, that there's nothing to see here that it's all taken care of, that in fact there is no problem whatsoever. But here's what the experts are saying, Speaker. The experts are saying this. We all know, yesterday I mentioned it, the Ontario Medical Association is saying it's going to take two and a half years to catch up on knee replacements alone. 16 months for heart bypass surgeries. 16 months, Speaker. 12 months for MRIs. Doctors are also speaking out. Uh, speaker, Dr. David Gomez, a, a trauma surgeon at Toronto St. Michael's Hospital, said, and I quote, this is a catastrophic problem the health care system will face for at least the next five years. So why is the government just writing off people's lives, writing off their well-being, and letting them suffer for up to five years with pain, Question. anxiety, and lack of health care? Minister of Health. Our government is certainly very cognizant of the time that many people have had to wait for these surgeries, and that's why we are making these significant investments, $500 million, in order to allow hospitals to operate uh, on weekends and during the evenings. We're also making significant investments for MRI and CT imaging, another $70 million to add, uh, 107,596 additional MRI hours and even more CT hours to the system. So we are working we're making the investments, we're investing in the space in hospitals, in the equipment that people need, in the health human resources, so that people can get the work done that they need to have done, and it's not going to take five years to do it. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what's happening here in Ontario is downright cruel, but it, it wouldn't have to be this way if we had a government that believed in good, quality, public health care. And we see that's not the case. We watched in long-term care as, the, as that was evidenced with the, uh, with the virus. The minister has to stop making excuses for the failures of her government. Dr. Gomez said, and I quote, many, many Ontarians are not going to get their surgeries. There's going to be a significant impact to people's lives, but also to their mobility, their fertility, and quality of life. Speaker, Ontarians don't have five years to wait to get a knee surgery, to walk, to work, to enjoy life again, or the fertility attention that they need to, to grow their family and their future. 
When is this Premier Question. going to stop making excuses, show some caring and compassion, prioritize the health and well-being of Ontarians, and plan and make the investments necessary to clear the backlog? The health and well-being of the people of Ontario has always been our government's top priority, especially during the last two years of dealing with this pandemic. And I'd like to remind the member opposite that in, we have increased health care spending from $59.3 billion billion in 2019-20 to an expected 64.1 billion in 2021 and 22. That is a significant investment in health care. We've invested the $5 billion in increasing hospital capacity. We've also spent uh, 22 we are, we will be investing $22 billion in the next 10 years in hospital infrastructure projects that will lead to $30 billion in capital investments. So we're building for the future as well as dealing taking care of this situation as it exists now we are putting the money into the and making the investments that we need to make, to make sure that we are helping the people that need our help with these uh, procedures and surgeries that they have been waiting a long time for but we're going to make it happen and again it's not going to take five years the next question Leader of the opposition. speaker my next question is also for the premier but i have to say people in ontario have learned to listen to the experts to listen to the people on the front lines, not the claims of this government. My next question, however, is on a different topic. As we all know, people are feeling the pinch of the rising cost of living. No one more so than people who rent in Ontario. Rents have skyrocketed in our province. Ontarians pay some of the highest rental costs for their accommodations, for their homes, in the entire country, Speaker. One bedroom, a one-bedroom apartment in Oshawa, $1,800, 2000 in Toronto, two-bedroom in Mississauga, almost $2,200. Why did the Premier create this problem by ripping up rent controls as one of his first actions when he became Premier of this province? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, thanks, Speaker. The, the Leader of the Opposition has got this all wrong again. When we uh, made that decision as part of our fall economic statement in 2018, New Democrats said that that wouldn't spur on new rental housing construction. They were wrong, Speaker. So, so very wrong. Today, Speaker, we're now seeing a high in purpose-built rental construction, the likes that we haven't seen since the early 1990s. Wow. Wow. We're building upon our policy, Great, Speaker. We're, we're working very diligently on a consultation right now with municipalities, with the industry, and with the public. We want to build upon the success. We know because of some of the reports out there, the Scotiabank report that shows that when it comes to the G7, Canada is, is, is last. We need to build all types of housing. We need to build more purpose-built rental housing, Response. more missing middle, more single family. Speaker, we're not going to go back to the days of no under New Democrats. Our government is going to continue to say yes. <laughs> well, Speaker, if people can't afford to live in the homes that this, uh, this uh, minister is claiming are being built, what use are they, Speaker, if people can't afford them? But on another afford affordability issue, Speaker, here's what the Premier huffed and puffed about in terms of gas price gouging not so long ago. He said, the gas companies, I'm putting you on notice, I'm putting you on notice, you're going to start gouging the people of Ontario. It's not going to happen. That's what this Premier said. Last night, gas prices rose Order. overnight by four cents a litre. By tomorrow, they're going to be going up another Order. 11 cents. Now, imagine if you're a PSW providing home care and you have to drive to each and every patient in your car, how much that's costing you. R drivers are paying $30 more education come a month. People can't afford it, Speaker. The Premier said he'd take on the big oil companies. He hasn't done so. He said he would take on overnight gouging. He hasn't done so. The oil companies are flush with money. They have question. billions of dollars in cash. And the drivers have record bills. So my question to the Premier is, why hasn't he stopped these big oil companies from gouging Ontarian drivers like he promised he would do? Why is he saying no? To respond, the Premier. I can't believe what I just heard from the other side of the aisle. You know, this is a government on the other side of the aisle, and I'm going to quote the member from Etobicoke Centre. Etobicoke Centre, 
They wanted Order. an additional 35 cents. The leader wanted the largest carbon tax increase in the world, in the absolute world. It's increased gas prices by 11 cents. As, and, and Mr. Speaker, again, you can't talk out of both Order. sides of your mouth here. Mr. Speaker, we're putting money back into people's pockets. I'm going to ask the Premier to take his seat. Stop the clock. And ask the Premier to withdraw his unparliamentary comment and conclude his answer. Mr. Speaker, we're putting money back into people's pockets. We're putting $120 of the license sticker fee that they aren't in favour of. They would never give back to the people of Ontario. We're making sure that we're cutting tolls on the 412 and 418, that the leader of the Liberal Party said that would never happen, Response. ever. We're making sure we put minimum wage at $15 an hour, make it more affordable to people that live. Mr. Speaker, we're a government that's cut taxes, not increased taxes. The final supplementary. Speaker, actions uh, are, are greater than words. The Premier didn't take on the gas companies like he said he was going to do. He did nothing on rents except make sure that they were skyrocketing and got rid of rent control. He even raised hydro rates each and every year since he became the Premier of this province. He stuck Ontarians with a, a high cost and low wage life here in this province. And it doesn't have to be this way, Speaker. When will this Premier realize that Ontarian, Ontarians need someone who will actually fix the crisis in affordability instead of making it worse, as this government has done? When will he step aside and let us do that job? Stop the call. The government side will come to order. The government house leader will come to order. And I'll remind the house one more time, in case people have forgotten. We don't make reference to the absence of other members, because from time to time, each of us might have a reason to be aware. Start the clock. The Premier can respond. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I just want to remind the people of Ontario, when we cut the gas uh, tax by 4.5%, the only province to do that, the NDP and the Liberals, they vote against it. Yep. They, they vote for the carbon tax of 11 cents more. Again, the member from uh, Ottawa Centre wants it to increase 35 cents a litre. The leader of the opposition wants it the highest carbon tax anywhere in the world. They believe in gouging the taxpayers. We believe in putting money back into the taxpayers' uh, pockets because they can spend it a lot Response. wiser than what we can. When it came to the 412 and 418, Del Duca, uh, the leader of the uh, Liberals, Mr. Del Duca, he said, we'll never get rid of the tolls. That's their mantel. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Brampton. Brampton. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my Toronto question South to the Cumber. Premier. A shocking new report this week from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirmed that we are unprepared for the impacts of climate change itself. Ontario can't afford to dither, hoping to fix climate-related problems like flooding, droughts, fires, or threats to food security after they arrive. We need to prepare now. But this Premier has spent more money fighting federal climate action in court than he has spent on preparing Ontario for climate change. This year's budget for climate change and resilience is only $15.8 million. Wow. Why won't this Premier make the necessary investments to make Ontario more resilient to the impacts of climate change? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, first time since January 12, 2021. Uh, Speaker, this government is taking action on climate change. We were the first province in Canada to make gas cleaner by increasing the renewable content in gasoline. That's the equivalent of taking over 300,000 cars off the road. We're partnering with industry like Algoma and Defasco, six megatons of greenhouse gas reductions. That's uh, through the electrification of the Arc Furnace, making Ontario a global leader in clean 
clean steel production. That's the equivalent of 1.3 million cars off the road or 245 million barbecue tanks, propane tanks full of greenhouse gas emission. We're taking real action. We've put forward real ideas. All we're hearing is rhetoric on the other side. Thank you, Speaker. Mm -hmm. Supplementary questions? Not a particularly useful answer, thank you. <laughs> um, again, back to the Premier. Instead of fast-tracking developments on wetlands and floodplains, the Premier could restore the powers of conservation authorities to protect people and property from floods, instead of putting food security at risk by paving over prime farmland with costly, sprawl-enabling highways that benefit his friends, he could work with municipalities to encourage sustainable, transit-friendly growth within existing communities. Instead of cancelling programs to make homes energy efficient, he could restore and expand them. Instead of ripping out electric vehicle chargers at GO stations, he could help local transit systems go all electric. Why has the Premier declared and carried on war against the environment instead of preparing right. Ontario for the impacts of climate change? Why? Minister of the Environment. You know, Speaker, I just gave tangible, massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions under the leadership of this Premier. And that's the difference. We're going to work with municipalities and we're going to work with industry. All that member opposite has is a higher carbon tax, Order. wants to tax people to death. All they offer Ontarians is misery and poverty. That's all they offer them. We've got a plan to build Ontario. We've got a plan to build a greener Ontario, largest investment in transit, working with industry to be a leader in in clean steel production, all they offer is negativity, rhetoric, and misery. Ontarians can see right through that. The next question, the member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. And if I could just say, Mr. Speaker, the incredible work that the minister has been doing across the province to activate our job creators. I just wanted to say on the behalf of the people in Brantford, Brant, thank you. Regional economic development has been a priority for this government since we were elected in 2018. Under the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, rural and northern Ontario businesses were abandoned and left to fend for themselves. Can the minister please inform this House how our government is leveling the playing field for our rural and northern businesses? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. We heard from the business community and we put our plan in action. First, we focused on every area that a government has some control over, like WSIB, taxes, and red tape. As a result, we lowered the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion every year. Then we put business supports in place, like the $100 million regional development program. This has given our manufacturing sector the certainty they needed to reinvest in Ontario. In St. Catharines, we saw Quick Plug invest $3.2 million in an expansion to make peat moss plugs for greenhouses and hydroponics. This is an important addition to our agriculture sector, but in addition to that, they added 30 jobs. Our government invested $480,000 through our Southwestern Development Fund. Speaker, this is one of the thousands of Ontario business success stories showing that Ontario is getting stronger. Supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. It is so great to hear that our government will continue to be there for our rural and northern businesses. We know that companies all across Ontario are ready to invest in the critical technologies needed to transform our automotive and manufacturing sectors. Now more than ever, especially as we recover from COVID, Ontarians need our government to support local manufacturers across the province, allowing companies to create good local jobs. Speaker, there is more to be done. So can the minister please tell this House what private sector investments is the ministry making and how will they create the conditions for long-term regional economic growth? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. As a result of lowering the cost of doing business in Ontario by $7 billion every year, we've seen our manufacturing sector take off. We were just in Welland and saw Valbruna, 
a manufacturer of specialty steel products, invest $50 million in a new electric arc furnace. This will improve efficiency and productivity and reduce their environmental footprint. They will be the first in Canada to produce high nickel alloys and other clean specialty steels. And they are uniquely capable of producing stainless steel. Indeed, they're the only source in all of Canada for stainless steel. Our government invested $4.4 million through the South Western Development Fund. This fund supports regional priorities and challenges and boosts the province's economic recovery. Speaker, this is yet another of the thousands of Ontario business success stories showing that Ontario is getting stronger. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mishkiga Block, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the First Minister, for the Prime Minister, Premier. For what I'm hearing in my writing, investments have not been made. In fact, cuts have forced non-emergency transfers, which used to be done by paramedics, to be downloaded to private transportation, now handled in, by hospitals, which obviously have little operating budgets. The result, I have seen my, in my writing, Madame Wimet, who had to wait three days to get a non-emergency transfer. She was in the hospital in pain waiting her transfer to get hip surgery. Speaker, why are Northerners, like Madame Wimet, who have to wait and suffer, not seeing the result of your so-called investments? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. First of all, we understand that uh, culturally um, uh, appropriate care is essential in supporting improved health outcomes for, especially for Indigenous peoples in the, in the North, as well as for all Northerners. We want to make sure that everyone has the care that they need. That's why we have a programmed and worked with uh, Anishinaabe Aski Nation men to uh, Operation Remote Immunity, working with Orange. That Orange assistance has continued throughout. It's very important to make sure that everyone in Ontario, regardless of where they live, has access to the health services that they need. We know that many people in Northern Ontario may need to be transported either to Thunder Bay or sometimes further south. NAN is there to support that and will continue to be. Supplementary question. I'm going to insist again on the fact that this government should stop cutting on the budget of the health care system. This woman I was mentioning, she's a clear example of how this is hurting Ontarians. She was left alone with no medicine with no response. Speaker, when will this government stop cutting the budget for the health care system and assure that patients receive the health care that they deserve? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, again, uh, to the member opposite, our government has increased health care spending, as I've indicated previously, from $59 billion before the pandemic to $64 billion now. And that includes the uh, creation also of Ontario Health with the local Ontario Health units to support patients wherever they are in the province and to make sure that people have that care wherever they need it within our health care system. That's why we created Ontario Health, in order to make sure that people, whether they need home care, whether they need surgical care or long-term care, will get the assistance that they need when they need it. We are continuing with the creation of our local Ontario Health Units. We've got about 95 percent of the Ontario population covered now, but we're going to continue with the creation of the units and make sure that they have the supports that they need to provide safe and culturally appropriate health care services, but also to deal with the social determinants of health, which many governments have talked about but have not actually done anything about. We are going to do it with those local Ontario health units. The next question, the member for Glengarry, Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, Ukrainians are continuing to fight bravely and relentlessly against an unprovoked, full-scale invasion by Russia. The Ukrainian forces and the civilians who have joined them are outmanned and outgunned, but they keep fighting. Their resilience is inspiring and remarkable. 
Yes, Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom, but they're also fighting for us, for democracy. It is cri critical that we, our government, and the international community do everything possible to ensure Putin does not win. Here at the provincial level, we're limited in things we can do within our jurisdiction, but it's important that anything we can do, we must do. I want to sincerely thank the government for pledging $300,000 in taking Russian vodka off the shelves at our LCBOs. Some of these measures are symbolic, but they're important. But things are escalating quickly and dramatically. Will the government take other measures to support our efforts in Ukraine? Reply, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the question from, uh, from the honourable member as we've been working uh, uh, across party lines uh, on this, Mr. Speaker, and uh, let me uh, thank all members of, uh, of the House uh, uh, on that. Uh, she did highlight some of the measures that the government took uh, immediately. I know that the Minister of uh, Citizenship and Multiculturalism uh, uh, did uh, convene a roundtable with a number of, uh, of members with respect to what kind of supports uh, uh, that we can uh, provide. One of the things we did here, of course, was uh, that uh, we should be in a position, a better position to bring uh, more Ukrainian refugees to, uh, to Canada, uh, and specifically to Ontario, and I know the Premier was very quick to announce that, and the Minister of Labour is, is working on that. But the other issue that we heard and have been hearing frequently, Mr. Speaker, is uh, assistance in terms of uh, a, le a lethal weaponry uh, being sent to support uh, the brave Ukrainian forces on the ground who have been doing a, an incredible job in the support of, of Ukraine. Response. And in the support of democracy, Mr. Speaker, and I know I know that the federal government has acted uh, on on that uh, as well. We're obviously not in a position, as the member has highlighted, to do that. Uh, but where we are in a position to help, we will help. And again, I thank all members. Uh, it's a very important issue. I thank all members for the unity that we've all expressed on that. Thank you. Any supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Putin regime is targeting and killing civilians, bombing apartments, bombing kindergartens, shooting ambulances, and much, much more. Absolutely no regard for international law, let alone human life. Il est essentiel que nous, notre gouvernement et la communauté internationale fassions tout notre possible pour que Poutine ne gagne pas. It is essential that we, our government and the international community, do everything we can to ensure that Putin does not win. Here at the provincial level, we're limited in the things we can do in our jurisdiction, but it is important that whatever we can do, we must do. I want to sincerely thank again the government for pledging 300,000 and removing Russian vodka from LCBO shelves. These are important steps. As we can see, the situation is worsening very rapidly. Will the Ontario government take further steps to support efforts in Ukraine? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank my colleague for her question. And as I said, the Minister for uh, Security and Multiculturalism is working and has announced immediately that we are going to give financial aids to the Ukrainian community. And we have also said that it is very important that we are going to invite Ukrainian refugees here in Ontario, and we are still working with the federal government in uh, order to have them here as fast as possible. And I would like to thank all my colleagues. We have been working all together with the communities in all the regions and uh, constituencies in order to help the Ukrainian community and in order to fight the uh, Russian actions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my first question is to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government strongly believes that all workers deserve to come home safe after a hard day's work. There are currently over 500 field inspectors, the highest number in Ontario's history, who visit workplaces across the province every day and help businesses comply with health and safety regulations. While the majority of businesses do everything they can to keep their workers safe, there are still some bad actors out there who pay fines and unfortunately continue to put workers at risk. Will the minister tell us what his ministry is proposing to put place stronger workplace protections for our everyday workers? Mr. Labour Training and Skills Development. 
Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, the member for this very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government has and continues to work for Ontario workers. We are leaving no st stone unturned to ensure their health and safety. They are our government's top priority. That's why I was pleased to announce stronger workplace protections in Bill 88, our Working for Workers 2, continues our promise to all workers and their families that we have their backs. Our bill, Mr. Speaker, if passed, would increase health and safety fines for businesses who put workers at risk to the highest in Canada. If convicted, these lawbreakers would face new maximum charges of up to $1.5 million for a worker being severely injured or killed on the job. Our message to those who treat injuries as a cost of doing Spons. business here in Ontario, no more. Supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Minister. And Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all, but it has also highlighted the impact of the ongoing public health concerns. Between March 2020 and January 2021, there are just under 25,000 opioid-related deaths in Ontario. These include deaths that occurred in the workplace. As ongoing public health crisis of opioid overdoses and deaths in Ontario continues, additional action is needed to save lives. Will the minister please tell us what our government is doing to address this public health crisis in the workplace? Great. Mr. Labour. Great. Thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, to the member, thank you for this very important question. Uh, Speaker, first, I want to offer my uh, condolences to the families of all of those who have died of an opioid overdose. One life lost is obviously one too many. Yesterday, uh, Speaker, I joined my colleague, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addictions, uh, to announce legislation that would require life-saving naloxone kits in any workplace where there is a risk of an opioid overdose. Our new policy, Mr. Speaker, is the very first in all of Canada, and it will be matched with support from our government to train workers and help employers get the kits that they need. We have to be ambitious in fighting this epidemic because everyone should come home safe after a hard day's work. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, the Independent Financial Accountability Office released its review of quarterly spending today and have found that, once again, the government is withholding money it promised to spend. This time, it's an astonishing $5.5 billion that's being held back by this government. Speaker, Ontario is only just starting to reopen after another devastating wave, a very painful lockdown, and the cost of everything from rent to groceries to gas they're all soaring. If there's ever been a time we needed this government to step in and shore up our health care, our housing, our public infrastructure, it's now. So, Speaker, through you to the Premier, why is this government putting Ontario's, Ontario's recovery at risk by withholding billions of dollars it promised to spend? Reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, we want to take an opportunity to thank the FAO uh, for his report and all the work that uh, he has been doing. But as a member opposite uh, will know that uh, the FAO's methodology does not take into consideration the full impact of the government's investments, as it excludes uh, consolidated entities as school boards, hospitals and agencies. But what I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, is on February 14th, the Minister of Finance tabled the Q3 uh, re financial reports in which this province invested an additional $2.3 billion into this province. That included $1.3 billion uh, in additional funding to support our hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. That included over $300 million uh, for the Ontario Spons. Business Cost Rebate Program and over $293 million for the Ontario uh, Small Business Relief Grant. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue to support the people of this province. Mr. Speaker, the minister doesn't even sound convinced. And those words are cold comfort, I'll tell you, for those waiting right now for backlogged surgeries who believe this premier's promise to clear them. Instead, they find out today 
that this government held back $1.3 billion in health care spending. But, Speaker, it gets even worse. Ontarians have been subjected to a flashy new taxpayer-funded ad campaign trumpeting this government's claims at success, like building bri bridges and highways and other infrastructure. But we know today from the FAO that they spent just 15 per cent of their promised infrastructure spending. So, Speaker, it's smoke and mirrors. Is this government's plan to put people back to work limited to the ad agencies, to Question. advertising, or will they actually spend the money they promised to get our economy moving again? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Also come to order, President of the Treasury Board to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. There is no uh, government in the history of this province that has spent more to keep its residents safe than this government. Yeah. As our public accounts showed last year, uh, over $19 billion was spent to support uh, the people of this province. Uh, just on, as I mentioned earlier, the Minister of Finance in his uh, quarter three report um, in which we are being transparent with the uh, public on all the spending that we are uh, doing as a government, we committed to an additional $2.1 billion or $2.3 billion in spending. That's supporting hospitals that need it uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. That includes supporting uh, Ontario's small businesses across this province. That includes making sure that our long-term care homes have money for prevention and containment of COVID-19. And it also uh, means that we're investing in additional funds to support uh, electricity cost relief for eligible businesses and residences. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Speaker, to the Minister of Health. <clears throat> for two years, our pandemic policy was based on gauging and preserving Ontario's hospital capacity. We we're told that we must go into lockdown, keep kids out of school, close business, delay surgeries, and disrupt normal life because COVID will overwhelm our hospitals. The most important metric was the effect of COVID on our hospitals. But two years, for two years, this government and this minister were not telling Ontarians the actual toll of COVID on our hospitals. Instead, they were inflating COVID hospitalizations by combining patients hospitalized as a result of COVID with patients tested for COVID but hospitalized for a whole other reason. Finally, in late December, the minister acknowledged the distinction. Turns out that about half the patients straining in our hospitals were there actually because of COVID, but the number given to us was double. The minister was knowingly inflating the numbers used to lock down and hurt 15 million Ontarians. Question, why did it take two years for the minister to differentiate the numbers, and will the minister apologize to all Ontarians? The House will come to order. Government House Leader to reply. Well, Speaker, everything in that question was wrong, so what I'll do is I'll take the opportunity to explain what we actually have done, Speaker. He was right in the sense that uh, when we took office, there was so little investments done to prepare Ontario for something like COVID that we had to move very, very quickly. That's why, even before a pandemic hit, we started investing in Ontario health teams. We started investing in hospitals. We started investing in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. All of these things had to happen because, as we've said, Constantly, this province was brought to its knees and had to have the longest and largest lockdowns because 800 people were in ICU capacity. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because the previous Liberal government refused to make those important investments in health care. They refused to make the investments in health and human resources, Mr. Speaker, and this government knew that that could not be the case. That's why we're making investing in 3,100 additional beds, Mr. Speaker, a massive investment to bring on new nurses, a massive investment in long-term care, new hospitals in Niagara, New hospitals in, in uh, Mississauga, Mr. Speaker. New hospitals in smaller communities because we understand that health care leads to economic growth, and that's what we're all about. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, it's regretful that the Minister of Health did not have the courage to answer the most important, one of the most important policy questions. Why did the government mislead Ontarians about the number of patients from. Stop the clock. Member will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Withdraw. Conclude his question. The 3,100 beds that the, that the government leader speaks of are the same 3,100 beds we've had in the first wave, and the second wave, and the third wave, but they're triple counting them. But most importantly, we'd like to understand why weren't the numbers 
given to Ontarians as they were? Why did it take two years on the single most important metric that was used to lock down Ontarians, close schools, close places of worship, close businesses? Why did it take two years to tell us that the burden of COVID that we thought we're actually dealing with was not the burden that we were dealing with? Could the Minister of Health Please tell us, why did it take her two years to differentiate between COVID, with COVID or from COVID and apologize to all Ontarians? And to respond, the government house leader. Again, uh, again, Speaker, I'm not sure that anybody understood that question, but what I will tell you is this, Mr. Speaker, is because of the work of this Minister of Health that we are adding health and human resource capacity. It's because of the work of this Minister of Health that Ontario has done better than almost any other jurisdiction in the world fighting COVID, Mr. Speaker. We have almost 90 per cent of our population that has received Two doses, Mr. Speaker, well on our way. I think it's actually three doses, Mr. Speaker. We are doing better than almost any other jurisdiction. 30, over 31 million Ontarians have been vaccinated in this province, Mr. Speaker, and we have kept people safe. And because of the fact that the previous Liberal government under Del Duca and Wynne and all of that crew refused to make important investments, not only in our large urban areas, but in smaller communities across this province, we are forced to do that, but we're like to, we like to do that because we understand how important health care is to a vibrant economy. And that is why we are making the investments that the previous Liberal government didn't do. And thanks to this Minister of Health, those investments are happening now, and in the future we will have the health care. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, on this side of the House, we understand that in order to improve the quality of life for all Ontarians, we must use every tool at our disposal. While real estate is one of our greatest uh, resources, historically, past governments haven't always gotten the greatest possible value from our properties, especially not under the Liberals. So, Speaker, through you, could the minister tell us what our government is doing to ensure that Ontarians are able to reap the greatest benefits from the many valuable public real estate assets at our disposal? I'd like to know. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Eglinton Lawrence for her question. And unlike the Wynne Del Duca uh, Liberal uh, red, uh, led government of the past that mismanaged our properties, Mr. Speaker, and squandered our tax dollars. Speaker, this government is finding innovative ways to generate additional value for the people of this province. And through the Center of Ontario's Realty Excellence Core, we are going to unlock value and bring additional revenue into our coffers from a pool of approximately 20 thousand real estate assets that are currently held by public entities within the province of Ontario. This means that we're going to be able to invest this money back into programs that matter most for Ontarians, like health care and education. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, but CORE is going to help us to sell unused properties, reducing operating costs for the government, and most importantly, putting Response? money directly back into the pockets of Ontarians and workers to help life make more Make life more affordable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer. This new proposed initiative certainly presents a fantastic opportunity for our province's not so distant future. Many Ontarians, including my constituents, want to learn more about how this will benefit them and what will happen to government properties in their community. So through you, Speaker, could the minister please explain how our government is able to leverage our public real estate assets toward helping Ontarians, strengthening our communities, and protecting our most vulnerable? Good idea. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for her question. And, and this, is, this is really a game changer for Ontario's realty market. Uh, when we look at the Centre Ontario uh, Centre of Realty Excellence, we're presenting Ontarians with an exciting opportunity for our government to not only save the people of this province money, but also to revitalize our individual communities and expand access to critical services. Properties that are underused or sit empty in our communities will be transformed to meet our government's vital priorities, such as building more affordable housing, 
or creating more long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, this is a win-win for the people of this province who are going to see savings while taking advantage of new supports that are happening right in their very own neighbourhoods, and this is all thanks to CORE. I'm proud that this is just one of the ways that we're building a stronger Ontario, Mr. Thoughts? Speaker, and we're doing this by having one lens on realty for the first time ever in the province of Ontario. One eye seeing all of our realty uh, uh, initiatives and being able to monitor those moving forward, Mr. Speaker. Next question, member for Kitchener Centre. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, CBC asked the Director of Education of the Waterloo Catholic District School Board about an incident where police were called to de escalate a black four year old child. Stating that all ministry approved policies were followed, the Director explained that she, and I quote, would take umbrage to the allegation that there is systemic racism in our board." End quote. The Minister of Education committed to an internal review, yet has not spoken about the pattern, pattern of racism in Peel, York, Windsor, Toronto, Simcoe. The list goes on. Speaker, these incidents are not isolated. Educational experts understand how racism operates, and they are calling on this government to do better. And so, through you to the Premier, will the Premier commit today to implementing an independent equity audit across all Ontario schools? Thank you, Sean, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I think we would both agree that there is no scenario in this province that a four-year-old child should have police called on them. Absolutely unacceptable. And I appreciate the member opposite's advocacy on this issue, as noted by the parents of black children who commented following the ministry's decision last Friday to call a third party review deploying a Ministry of Education uh, 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 review of the handling of that board. The parents of black children said, quote, we're pleased that the ministry has heeded the calls of the community to conduct a third party investigation. We are committed to fighting racism in schools. In Peel specifically, as a member noted, we were the first government in the history of this province to call in a supervisor because of anti-black racism, the first in this country. And I accept there's more to do. We appreciate the member's bill specifically to help combat Spons. racism in schools, and I'm prepared to work with her and all members to fight the scourge of racism and hate that's happening in our schools, in our society. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and back to the Premier. Speaker, education is a continuum, and recognizing the patterns of racism in the different boards is important as we try to address this. Reports of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and the harsher discipline of black, brown, and indigenous students continues to push them out of school. And what happens in K-12 is reflected on college and university campuses. When people speak out, the punishment is severe. York University professor Dr. Emi Avalanto is a perfect example. After raising issues of racism in his home faculty, he's now had to spend five years navigating never-ending investigations. The Racial Equity in Education Act provides us with the tools to build anti-racist educational systems that aren't scared to address the patterns of racism. So through you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier, will this government commit today to making Bill 67 law? What, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for that question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think we all agree in this House, uh, racism over the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic, has been on the rise. And uh, since taking a uh, role in my ministry, Mr. Speaker, since last June, I've been working with all of our stakeholders, all of the community leaders, organizations, and to find ways to, to address them. And our government is absolutely committed to working with every single Ontarian, Mr. Speaker, on this important issue. And we're committed to making the necessary resources available and investments. And we have been in tune of over $30 million, Mr. Speaker, including the doubling of our anti-racism, anti-hate grant from $1.6 to $3.2 two million dollar mr speaker recently we announced another 25 million dollar historic investment mr speaker Response. when it comes to protecting our places of worship and other cultural organizations we know our work isn't done mr speaker there's more to do we're committed to doing it until this issue is absolutely addressed thank you mr speaker thank you next is the member for ottawa Daniel. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I didn't think I would have to rise again this week in this House to ask the same question that I asked twice last year. The government has had weeks to prepare a support financial support package for Ottawa. Where is it? I've been talking daily with uh, BIAs during the occupation and again last night to talk about the lasting effects of the loss of revenues. The BIA in our downtown core in Ottawa noted that, quote, from a landlord perspective, our level of non-payment of rent is dangerously high. I have a large consent, concern if the money doesn't flow quickly, we will end up with landlords defaulting as well. So am I asking the government, will the government commit to matching the money given by the federal government to these struggling businesses? Mr. Finance. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for that important question from the member uh, opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. There's no question that uh, our government recognizes the, uh, the that the health measures have come at a cost, and particularly for businesses in in the Ottawa region who have faced a, a unique circumstances with the with the occupation in that uh, in that city. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the member opposite that we have been there. For not only businesses in Ottawa, we've been for uh, been there for businesses right across this province, uh, not least of which uh, were highlighted by the President of the Treasury Board. Over three billion dollars of support for small business uh, grants to over 100,000 businesses, including many businesses, including the third round highlighted by the President of the Response. Treasury Board including the property tax and the electricity relief, including the deferral of $7.5 billion of provincially administered taxes, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I can't believe that there's no announcements for financial support. The, the business is struggling. Ottawa is the second biggest city in Ontario, and Ottawa workers are Ontarian workers. And the government should be supporting all Ontarians, not only in the areas in which the government wishes to win seats. A thousand businesses in my riding could not operate, and that took away the paychecks of thousands of workers. It has already been too long for workers who are barely getting by. So would the Minister of Finance please tell me when Ottawa will receive desperately needed financial support from this government? Mr. Finance. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and a very important question uh, from the member opposite. And as I look straight across here, I see a number of members from the Ottawa region, and we have many on our side of the uh, the aisle here as well, Mr. Speaker. A very important question, and as I mentioned in the scrum yesterday, uh, we've been uh, having conversations with those BIAs, with the uh, the people affected in the region. We're working with uh, many counterparts, to, and I'll have uh, some more to say in the coming days. As I said yesterday, and it hasn't been years, by the way. You mentioned years. It's, you meant uh, in the past few weeks. But we recognize uh, the struggle of many businesses in, in Ontario, not least of which is, is Ottawa, given the unique situation there. Uh, we'll continue to uh, work with uh, businesses right across this province because you know what? We're getting stronger every day. This province is getting stronger. We're building back this province, Sponsor. and I will look forward to the economic recovery that all families, workers, and businesses will look forward to in this province. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mount. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Sherwood Secondary School in my riding of Hamilton Mountain is home to over 1,200 students, countless education staff, and is the centre of the Sherwood Heights community. Sherwood is one of two secondary schools to offer an excellent French immersion program. Eight elementary schools feed into Sherwood for this program alone. Sherwood is at risk of closing as this government recently denied the eighth funding proposal request for repairs that is needed to make this school safe. The Hamilton Wentworth District School Board set aside $9 million to contribute to these repairs, but this government couldn't even meet them halfway. Speaker, schools in Ontario need to be repaired, not closed. Can the Premier commit to providing the funding that Sherwood Secondary Question. School needs to complete these repairs so their school can remain open? Here, here. Minister of Education. 
Well, thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite for the question. I'm proud that since 2018, over $100 million of capital investments in Hamilton alone have been completed to improve the standards after 15 years of school closures and of the deferred maintenance backlog increasing to $16 billion. Absolutely unacceptable. That is the record of the Kathleen Wynne Del Duca Liberals. Having said that, there's $75 million in active projects underway to improve the state of those schools, to modernize them, improve ventilation, expand spaces and childcare. And I look forward to receiving the applications from all school boards submitted by uh, submitted to the ministry just days ago as we work to approve another round of $500 million of capital investment so we can provide the best learning spaces for children in Hamilton and right across Ontario. Speaker, the school repair backlog has ballooned under this government. It has grown by $1 billion since this Premier took office. There needs to be real investment into our schools so staff and students have an environment they can thrive in. School boards must be given the tools that they need to support their communities, yet all this government seems to do when it comes to education is cut. Sherwood Secondary is a fundamental part of our community in Hamilton. Mountain. Our community made a decision to save this school during the ARC process in 2012. I encourage the Premier and his government to actually listen to our community on this matter and to save Sherwood. Will the Premier respect the community's decision and save Sherwood Secondary High School? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we appreciate the advocacy from the member opposite. We're going to continue to invest over $75 million in active construction in Hamilton schools. I will challenge the member opposite, though, because we just announced a, a plan, an investment in public education increasing by $580 million more million under this progressive Conservative government, the highest investment in public education ever recorded in the history of Ontario. $90 million. 420 per cent increase in mental health funding from Order. the former Liberal government. The highest investment in special education, $3.2 billion, over $90 million more to help children with exceptionalities. We announced Ontario's Learning Recovery Action Plan, $175 million, a net investment to provide tutoring, publicly funded tutoring, Order. small groups averaging five, to all children in Response. all parts of Ontario. This is a responsible plan to get our kids back on track and Canada Premier to continue to invest in public education. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Recently, the Premier said the province is ready to receive Ukrainian refugees seeking to escape their country's war zone. But most Ukrainians are not double vaccinated against COVID-19. 66 percent, in fact. The government is also allowing employers in Ontario, which is likely the vast majority, to continue using discriminatory vaccine passport requirements on employees. So what is the government's plan? Are they going to screen Ukrainians coming here to ensure they are all double vaccinated against COVID-19? Or is the government having Ukrainians come here facing the prospects of it being harder to find a job because of their decision not to disclose their vaccine status? Or will the government consider a measure like legislating a ban on the discriminatory pr practice of allowing employers to voluntarily continue using vaccine proof or passport measures? Minister of Labour. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I do want to thank the member for this uh, very uh, important question. I want to begin um, to uh, let the people of Ukraine know that we are thinking of them. Uh, we're working uh, every single day uh, to ensure that uh, when many of them arrive here in Ontario, we're going to have the supports uh, to be there uh, in place for them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I speak on a regular basis with, basis with the Minister of Immigration federally, uh, Sean Fraser. Uh, we've offered Ontario's full support uh, to ensure that we help uh, these people leave uh, the crisis that they're facing. And I can uh, commit to all members of this House and to all people of Ontario, to all of the people in Ukraine, that we will be there for them. Uh, to work with the federal government to ensure that they uh, have better lives when they get to Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, in their announcement, the Premier and his Minister of Labour said we have a labour shortage in Ontario, and Ukrainian refugees can help fill those positions that number more than 300,000. But, Speaker, the labour shortage in Ontario has been exacerbated by this government's policies, including their decision to allow employers to fire thousands of people for the last year because those people refused to use a vaccine passport or have some personal reason for not taking the COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, for a year, people were losing their jobs 
And this government wasn't even protecting those who recovered from COVID from the discriminatory practice of employers mandating, mandating COVID-19 vaccination. And of course, none of these policies made a difference. There was no COVID zero. What has this government done to look into having employers rehire Ontario workers who lost their job because Question. of discriminatory policies and fill the labour shortage? What's the solution for these people? Minister of Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, we live uh, in the greatest province and the greatest country uh, on the face of this earth, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm proud to say, under the leadership of Premier Ford, uh, working with our labour partners, work, working with uh, business, Mr. Speaker. Uh, companies have stepped up. More than 20,000 jobs are waiting for people of Ukraine when they get here, Mr. Speaker. That is a great story. That is a Canadian and Ontario spirit. But, Mr. Speaker, I would argue with the member opposite. Uh, there's been a skilled trades shortage in this province long before COVID-19 uh, hit Ontario. Mr. Speaker, for far too long, in Ontario, under successive governments of all different stripes, they told every single young person that they must go to university yeah. to be successful. What we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is leveling the playing field. We're beginning a skilled Spons. trades uh, training much younger uh, in the education system. Mr. Speaker, we're sending dozens of recruiters into every high school across the province uh, to recruit people uh, into these amazing careers. We all know people in the skilled trades, Mr. Speaker, making six figures with defined pensions and benefits. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Beaches East Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last year, the City of Toronto announced a supportive housing project in my riding of Beaches East York, and the Ford government immediately passed a ministerial zoning order to ensure it would happen quickly. And by the way, every elected official in Beaches East York stood shoulder to shoulder and supported it. We need that housing. This year, the government declined to pass a similar MZO in Willowdale, the riding of the Associate Minister of Transportation, presumably to avoid annoying those voters who don't want a supportive housing project near them right before an election. Now those housing units are sitting empty in a parking lot, and people are literally freezing to death on the streets of Toronto. When will the government build the deeply affordable housing that Ontario desperately needs? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, Speaker, I'll ask that member of, of that party a question. Why won't they support our call for the federal government for another $490 million yep. that we're owed to help those people who are at risk of being homeless? Speaker, we've worked with Toronto City Council over the last year. They've requested seven housing or long-term care-related MZOs. We've delivered on six of those seven. Yeah, yeah, we've accelerated yeah. the creation of over 54,000 housing units across the province and another 600 supportive housing units. We're working with the council. Uh, the minister has been engaged with, the, with Mayor Tory. Uh, to, to look at this project uh, and, and to try to find a way to move it forward, but to, but to have this member categorize that we haven't been uh, we haven't been cooperating with Toronto Council is absolutely incorrect. In fact, Mayor Tory supports our fair share campaign to the federal yeah, government. In yeah. fact, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Being no further business at this time, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.